Um, well, thank you, Your Honor, for your time this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, Your Honor, I won't spend any time going through the, the general standard on a motion to dismiss. I know Your Honor is well aware of that, uh, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, Your Honor, our position is straightforward. Uh, a cause of action for intentional infliction of emotional distress was not intended to include liability for a defendant who does nothing, who has no contact with the plaintiff. All of our arguments reg regarding outrageousness, legally permissible conduct, causation, and the presence of the plaintiff all go back to that premise and show why there is no for this action in this context. Conduct that amounts to remaining silent and maintaining privacy is not intentional infliction of emotional distress. And there are no cases where such conduct was found to be intentional infliction of emotional distress. Rather, plaintiffs argue that the laundries had an obligation, a duty to speak. The law imposes no such obligation to speak, and the state and federal, federal constitutions support that. In our society, under our laws, people are free not to speak. Your Honor, the elements of the cause of action alleged are a deliberate or reckless infliction of, a, of mental suffering, outrageous conduct, the conduct caused the emotional distress, and the distress was severe. Uh, I'll first address the outrageous conduct element, Your Honor. So the standard for uh, determining whether or not conduct is outrageous is that the behavior claimed to constitute the intentional infliction of emotional distress must be so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go, all, as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency. That is conduct that is atrocious and utter standard and the subjective response of the plaintiffs is not what controls. The issue of whether or not conduct is outrageous is a question of law and for the court to decide. And that standard is extremely high in Florida. It is not enough that the defendant acted with an intent which is tortious or even criminal or that the defendant intended to inflict emotional distress or even that the defendant's conduct can be characterized by malice or a degree of aggravation which would entitle, to plaint, entitle the plaintiff to punitive damages for another tort. Now, Your Honor, looking at the amended complaint in this case, paragraph 32 provides a summary of what the plaintiffs alleged is the conduct that was outrageous. So they allege first, failing to advise the plaintiffs that Ms. Petito was deceased. Second, failing to disclose to the plaintiffs the location of Ms. Petito's body. Third, taking a family vacation with their son, Brian Laundry, who they allege had murdered Ms. Petito while the plaintiffs were looking for Ms. Petito. Fourth, blocking access to their cell phone and Facebook page to preclude the plaintiffs from contacting them and getting information regarding Ms. Petito. And finally, that the laundry's attorney, not the laundry's themselves, issued a statement to the press expressing hope that the search for Ms. Petito is successful and that Ms. Petito is reunited with her family. Is there a distinction between the attorney doing it on behalf of the laundry's versus the laundry's? Well, Your Honor, the attorney is obviously not a defendant in this case, and there are no allegations that in the, within the complaint that the laundries directed the attorney to make that statement, what information the attorney had with regard to making that statement. Uh, so, Your Honor. Isn't the law attorney the agent of the client? I, I, do, gr I do agree with that, Your Honor. Um, then, then why does it matter that the attorney and not the laundries themselves made the statement? Well, Your Honor, what we don't know, what is not alleged in the complaint, the attorney was making that statement on behalf of the laundries or whether he was making that statement in his personal capacity. Well, um, on a motion to dismiss, how am I supposed to construe the well-pled allegations? Your, Your Honor, on a motion to dismiss, I, I, would, I would argue to the court that 
by not alleging in the complaint that the attorney was the agent of the plaintiff, or I'm sorry, of the defendants for purposes of making that statement, that they have that the, that the plaintiffs have not alleged sufficient conduct that would um, that would uh, cause liability for the defendants for for the statement by their attorney. Well, assume for the sake of argument, the court concludes that there was sufficient allegations that the attorney is the agent for the laundry. So assume that to be true. Now we have a situation where the laundries themselves are making a statement and not standing silent. So what does that do to your argument about staying silent? Your Honor, I still, I still don't, um, I, I, I still don't think it necessarily makes a difference. I mean, I understand, I understand what the court's saying that um, that if we impute that statement to the defendants, that, that that would not be complete silence by them. However, the defendants do have a constitutional right to have an attorney and to have that attorney speak. Um, so again, Your Honor, in, in, in my view, the attorney was merely exercising the constitutional rights of both the attorney and of his clients uh, by making a statement. Okay, but, but when, when you make an affirmative statement, that's the antithesis of staying silent, right? I, I would agree with that, Your Honor, yes. You may continue. Thank you. Your Honor, the, uh, the plaintiff's claim of outrageous conduct in this context is novel. Uh, the plaintiffs have cited no cases where a person's silence with, except with, with, with regard to uh, what Your Honor just raised with regard to their attorney's statement, um, was considered outrageous regardless of the circumstances. And they certainly haven't cited any cases where uh, a statement by a person's attorney has been considered outrageous. Um, all of the cases they've cited involve some action by the defendant. Accepting the allegations of the amended complaint is true and allowing the case to proceed further. We're, we're going to hit the pause button. You're not going to miss a moment of this. We just have to hit a quick break. Don't go anywhere. This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. spending part of your Wednesday afternoon with us here on Court TV. I'm Julie Grant. We want to go back in to the hearing happening in Venice, Florida right now. The parents of Gabby Petito are suing the parents of her fiance, Brian Laundry. Right now, one of the attorneys representing the Laundry parents, uh, his name is Matthew Luca. He's delivering arguments to the judge saying essentially this lawsuit should be dismissed. We're going to go back in now where we left off. The wife, a husband, just anybody. Um, my, my, my argument is not that there was a privilege between Brian Laundrie and his parents. My argument is that even if Brian Laundrie conveys information to his parents, that they don't have a requirement then to speak with regard to that information. They don't have to share it. Um, okay, well, let's, let's go down that road for a moment because this is where I'm having some difficulty. I fully understand and get the constitutional right to remain silent. That being said, we're on a motion to dismiss on a complaint where I have to assume the facts are true. And you're trying to get me to say that the complaint itself demonstrates the existence of a, a right to remain silent. And I'm trying to understand how that is, or is that more of an affirmative defense that should be fleshed out in the pleadings? Your Honor, I, I, don't, I don't agree that it's an affirmative defense that needs to be fleshed out. I, I believe the court can, um, you know, obviously the complaint alleges that the, that the defendants were residents of the state of Florida, so the Constitution of Florida and the Constitution of the United States apply to them. And if you look at the complaint, Your Honor, even though it doesn't allege a formal criminal investigation. Um, it doesn't use those magic words, so to speak. It does allege that Brian Laundrie murdered Miss Petito. It alleges that Brian Laundrie engaged in conduct to try to uh, cover that up by sending text messages and things like that. It alleges that the defendants, the, his parents, um, the Laundries, um, were trying to uh, help him escape the country. Uh, it alleges that the Laundry family hired an attorney. 
And then once they hired the attorney, at that point, all the, all the uh, contact with the plaintiff stopped. Um, and the only statement we have is that one statement by, her, by, by their attorney that, that the court referenced. So under those circumstances, as alleged in the complaint, Your Honor, that's enough for the court to say somebody in that situation could invoke their Fifth Amendment privilege. That, that's, not, that's not something that the court would need to find additional facts. Uh, it's, there, the court does not need to look outside the four corners of the complaint. There are sufficient allegations within the complaint that would trigger somebody in that situation exercising their Fifth Amendment privilege. Your Honor, would you prefer that for me to continue with, with the outrageous element or move on to the, to the legally permiss permissible element, since that seems to be... Um, Wh whichever way you want to go. I'll, okay, thank I'll you, Your Honor. I'm not shy in asking questions. I understand. Your Honor, the, the plaintiff's cause of action could also extend to somebody who, you know, may not be in the situation where they uh, were told something, but maybe they witnessed something, or maybe they came upon some evidence, or... And somehow, or somehow they had some information that might be relevant to some tragic event. Um, the plaintiff's cause of action would impose an obligation on people like that to contact the families who may be involved in that situation and disclose what they knew, or they would fear being sued. The, the slippery slope of allowing this cause of action to proceed would really require anyone with knowledge of events that are hurtful or which cause emotional distress to another to convey, to convey their knowledge or potentially be exposed to liability. Now, the underlying crime... But, but, but again, I go back to there's an allegation that the laundries made an affirmative statement and put out into the public various statements. So am I not supposed to consider that conduct because that's a voluntary act by the laundries. I, I understand, Your Honor, it, and I, I, I assume you're referring to the one statement by the attorney alleged in the complaint. Um, it, assuming for the sake of argument that that is an affirmative statement by the laundries, um, Your Honor, you can definitely consider that, but again, in the, in the context of the overall case, is that statement alone sufficient to meet the standard for outrageousness. If for, let's say for example, I had you know, some knowledge about a crime that somebody committed and I made a public statement about some aspect of that case but I didn't share everything that I knew or I, didn't, or I you know, hedged, hedged my bet, so to speak. Would I then be subject to liability because I shared something but I didn't share other things? That, that's really the question, Your Honor. Um, is, is what, what are we going to require of people in a situation like this? Are we going to require them to say everything that they know? Or are they going to be allowed to speak freely or not speak at all? That's, that's really the question before Your Honor. And Your Honor, I think, I think it's important to keep in mind the standard that we're talking about here. That the, that the conduct has to be atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized society. You know, people who are faced with difficult challenges have to make difficult choices. And in our society, which I would propose is civilized, recognizes at its core that things like remaining silent or speaking through an attorney are foundational rights. And those are choices that our, that our society considers entirely tolerable. And in fact, they're codified in our founding documents. So, Your Honor, even considering the statement by the attorney, I, I, would, I would submit to Your Honor that, that that's not atrocious, it's not intolerable in a civilized society for their attorney to make a statement for them like that. Your Honor, another thing I'd like to address that the plaintiffs raised in their response is that, um, that the laundries were somehow in an unequal position to, um, to the plaintiffs, and that, that made their conduct particularly outrageous. Uh, Your Honor, I, I don't think that um, the standard for unequal positions is really what the plaintiffs uh, would, the, the plaintiffs would qualify that under, for, for, under this circumstance. Um, Your Honor, in uh, Dependable Life Insurance Company versus Harris, which is a fifth DCA case from 1987, it's, uh, it's cited in our papers. Um, 
Your Honor, in that case, and what the plaintiffs rely upon is, is um, restatement of torts section 46, subsection E, which states this unequal position argument. And, and what the restatement says is, the extreme and outrageous character of the conduct may arise from an abuse by the actor of a position or a relation with another which gives him actual or apparent authority over the other or the power to affect his interests. Thus, an attempt to extort money by a threat of arrest may make the actor liable even where the arrest or the threat alone would not do so. In particular, police officers, school authorities, landlords, and collecting creditors have been held liable for extreme abuse of their position. Even in such cases, however, the annoyances that are not extreme, I'm sorry, even in such cases, however, the actor w has not been held liable for mere insults, indignities, or annoyances that are not extreme or outrageous. So, Your Honor, in, in Harris, um, what the court recognized there is that the result of this unequal position must be something that is akin to extortion, meaning that somebody threatens... You're watching the Petito parents sitting there, uh, does it occur to you how much Gabby Petito looked like her mom? Uh, her mom and dad in the courtroom Brian Laundrie's parents have chosen not to go into the courtroom today, just having uh, their attorney represent them. We're hitting pause. You're not going to miss a moment of this, but I want to bring in my guests for some important analysis right now. Judge Kimberly Bando is in the studio with me and joining me remotely, forensic psychologist Dr. John Delatore. Uh, judge, I want to go to you as we were watching together. You're also really watching the judge. Um, what do you think so far about what he might do? I think the judge, based on his questions, he's going to deny the motion to dismiss because he keeps focusing on the fact that the parents made an actual affirmative statement and that he has to assume that the statement and the allegations are true. So he keeps telling him, give me a reason to not go with that, and he keeps not addressing the judge's issue. And so the judge is like, I'm telling you what the problem is, and you keep not addressing it. So he's going to get that motion denied. I appreciate it, Judge. And uh, Dr. John, as we're sitting there looking at the Petito parents, I mean, it's, it's just heartbreaking thinking about this. How about for someone who suffered a loss to go back into a courtroom and to hear things, can it be very more triggering maybe than people might realize? Oh, absolutely. It, it can be triggering in all different kinds of ways. You know, I, I think uh, the Petitos probably wanted to actually confront, you know, the, the laundries and, and not having that, that opportunity. Uh, I, I think that a lot of this is just goes to show that there's so many different ways that justice can 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 happen, but that it might not be what they actually wanted when it comes to to justice. Yeah, I certainly can't blame the Petito parents for trying to do something legally, uh, being in the position they're in. And we know the attorney for the laundries has to advocate as well. Essentially, he's saying, look, you know, this might seem heartless, but not actionable is the argument being put before his honor. We're going to squeeze in a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll take you back live to Venice, Florida for more of the hearing between the Petito parents and the laundry parents. Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thank you for spending part of your Wednesday afternoon with us. We are watching a civil hearing playing out in Florida between the parents of Gabby Petito and the parents of her former fiance, Brian Laundry. The Petitos have sued the Laundries, alleging intentional infliction of emotional distress, saying that they knew that their son had murdered their daughter. Again, this is their allegation, not ours. They're saying they knew this, they knew where their daughter's remains you know, were, and they didn't do anything to help them find her, adding to their mental anguish and the grieving they were already going through when their daughter didn't return home from that trip she went on with her fiance. And so they've sued the laundries, and the laundries have chosen to just have their attorney represent them today in court. They are not physically present there, but the Petitos are. So we're picking up where we left off. Attorney Matthew Luca is one of the attorneys representing the laundry parents, and he's giving arguments to the judge, asking the judge to dismiss the lawsuit, saying that, you know, first of all, there's no way to prove they knew anything about Gabby Petito being dead, but second of all, even if they did, that they had no obligation to say anything about it. Let's go back in together now. Somebody threatens another person 
based upon their position to cause some harm. Like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cause you to lose your job. I'm gonna cause you to be arrested. Uh, I'm gonna hurt your family, something like that. that. That's really what it's about. It's about somebody who has some authority to affect the person's, the person's life. Um, it's, not, it's not a situation where somebody might have information that another person doesn't have and they simply don't share it. That, that's not really what, um, what the Harris case or what the restatement are talking about when they say unequal positions. Now, Your Honor, moving on to the, um, to the assertion of illegal rights, um, the standard with regard to that element is that the conduct, although it would otherwise, otherwise be extreme and outrageous, may be privileged under the circumstances. And the actor is never liable, for example, where he has done no more than insist upon his legal rights in a permissible way, even though he is well aware that such insistence is certain to cause emotional distress. Now, we have several rights at play here, Your Honor. Uh, you, brought, you brought up one earlier, the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. That is certainly one of them. There's also the First Amendment um, right of freedom of thought, which would include uh, both the right to speak freely and the right to not speak at all. Um, and that was cited in, in Woolley versus Maynard, a Supreme Court case from 1977. Again, it, it's in our papers. Um, well, aren't, aren't we responsible for the words that we say when we say them? I, I, would, I would agree with that, Your Honor, certainly. Certainly, if you I, say words... I mean, Johnny uh, Depp just got found civilly liable for defamation by what his attorney said, right? I, I, again, Your Honor, I, I understand that in certain contexts, the statements of an attorney could potentially be, you know, lead to something like defamation. I, I agree with you on that. Um, I think really what we're, con what we're talking about here, though, Your Honor, is a statement by, by an attorney that even in and of itself is certainly not defamation and it, and it is not outrageous. Uh, even well, again, my, even under my understanding of the statement, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the laundry's new. And again, this is on a motion to dismiss, so I have to accept what is alleged as true. Not that it is true, but I have to accept it as true. That the laundry's new where the uh, Gabby's body was. And they put out a statement in the middle of the search, hoping about the success of that search and then not either directing them or either staying silent. I mean, that's kind of my understanding of what is being alleged. Is that correct or am I misunderstanding? No, no, I, I believe that's my understanding as well, Your Honor, that the, that the attorney made the statement while the search was ongoing and knowing exactly where the Gabby's body was. Well, Your Honor, again, that, uh, that's, that's the rub, is the plaintiffs haven't alleged anything in the complaint as to what the attorney's knowledge was when he made that statement, that, that, he, that he had that information. That, that's a totally different thing. They've alleged that the, the parents, the defendants, had that information, but they don't allege that that information was ever shared with the attorney or that the attorney had that information when he made that statement. That, 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 that is, that's kind of the issue, is they haven't really made any allegations about the attorney and what he may or may not have known. Um, it's really all about what the parents knew. And they don't make any allegations about what the parents communicated to the attorney. So really, the, attorney, the attorney's statement, again, if just looking at it within the four corners of the complaint, there really isn't enough there to say that whether or not when the attorney made that statement, what, what his knowledge was about, about any of the facts of the case, frankly. Um, and, and I would also submit to you, Your Honor, that that, that, that statement's fairly benign. I, I mean, I understand in the context um, that, you know, that, they, that they've alleged um, it could be construed as, as, as trying to divert attention or something like that, but... Um, I, I, again, it's a fairly benign statement. I mean, he's really just expressing that he hope, that he hopes that she returns. I, you know, uh, and again, they haven't alleged what information he had when he made that statement. It, it isn't the context really what's important here, and that's what the second DCA said in that insurance case where they, the adjuster denied coverage and did so knowing that the person didn't have long to live and just wanted to out, outlive the person. And the second, which is binding on me, found that that to be outrageous conduct. 
That, that is true, though, Your Honor. In that, in that case, uh, the second DCA said that um, the actions of the insurance company in simply denying the claim, even though they had been ordered by a judge of compensation claims to pay the claim, that that in and of itself would not have been outrageous. But what made it outrageous was that there was some sort of internal um, you know, decision made that they're just not going to pay it for a certain period of time in the hopes that the plaintiff would die. Um, I, I, I agree with you that that, that that made that particular case you know, rise to the level of outrageousness. I, I, Your Honor, frankly, the, the statement by the attorney in this case doesn't come even close to that level of outrageousness. I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, withholding medical care in the hopes that somebody dies so you don't have to pay for it. I mean, I, I don't think anybody, any of us sitting here would, would not find that to be outrageous. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about a statement by an attorney sort of, uh, you know, boilerplate and generic just expressing that he hopes that the, you know, that it's, the search is successful and whatnot. I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't really equate those two. I mean, I do agree with your point, Your Honor, that the context is important. We do have to consider the context as alleged in the complaint in, in this situation. Um, but I would just submit to Your Honor that, that what, even, even considering that context within the complaint, uh, the attorney's statement um, is, not, is not outrageous. You have about five minutes left in your argument. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. So, um, I'll, I'll move forward, Your Honor. I, I know we filed a motion, and Your Honor has read it, so I'm not going to try to belabor too many points here. But you know, with with regard to the um, with regard to the assertion of legal rights, really, you know, the plaintiffs recognize that the laundries have constitutional rights, and that the conduct that they have alleged within the complaint is really an exercise of those rights. So, so what they argue in response. Um, is that the court on a motion to dismiss shouldn't consider certain things. Number one, because they allege that they haven't, that they, within the complaint, they haven't alleged state action. Number two, um, that they haven't alleged any constitutional rights within the complaint, and so um, the court shouldn't consider them. And then fourth, that the constitutional rights are affirmative defenses. Um, Your Honor, with regard to the state action argument, um, as an initial matter, just because the government isn't trying to compel something, someone to do something doesn't mean constitutional rights don't go away. If you don't protect your own constitutional rights, even when the government's not trying to do something to you, then you would likely waive them. You know, if, if the defendants in this case had made a bunch of statements, uh, even if they were, those statements weren't to law enforcement, those statements could be used, absolutely be used against them. So, you know, in that sense, Your Honor, those rights exist, irregardless of whether the, uh, the state is involved. Um, Your Honor, also, as a, sec as a second point, there is state action involved here. Um, and one of the cases we cited to Your Honor in, in our motion sort of sums it up. It's Gerber versus Longboat Harbor, North Condo. Um, it's, a, it's a Middle District of Florida case from 1991. And that, and that court said, defendant's motion to dismiss is predicated upon its assertion that since it is not a governmental enter entity and has not assumed substantially all of the functions of a government en governmental entity, the provisions of the First Amendment as incorporated in the 14th Amendment simply do not apply. This court cannot agree with defendant's contention, and by applying the principles enumerated in Shelley v. Kramer, which is a Supreme Court case that sort of set forth that... Um, the third branch of government, the ju judicial branch, is also state action. This court found and continues to find that judicial enforcement of private agreements contained in a declaration of condominium constitutes state action and brings, he and brings the heretofore private conduct within the scope of the 14th Amendment, through which the First Amendment guarantee of free speech is made applicable to the states. Now, obviously, we're not dealing with a contract here or a condo association or anything like that. But the point is the same, that when, the, when a party tries to use the courts to enforce something, then there is state action. And in this case, Your Honor, the plaintiffs want the court to enter a judgment against the defendants. They presumably will want the court to enforce that judgment. And they want to use the court's authority to compel the defendants to participate in the, in the discovery process, all of which implicates their First Amendment, Fifth Amendment, all of their rights, Sixth Amendment right to counsel. So, Your, Your Honor, in that regard, there is state action. Um...
All right, we're hitting the pause button here. Uh, did you hear the judge referencing the Johnny Depp trial? Let me bring in my guest now still with me, Magistrate Judge, Criminal Defense Attorney and former Prosecutor Kimberly Bando and Dr. John Delatore, Forensic Psychologist, remotely in San Antonio for us. Uh, judge, I know you smiled and laughed when you heard uh, his honor's reference uh, to that. Of course, we're all still talking about the Depp trial, right? Um, what did you think? He did make a valid point, right, about responsibility for our words. Yeah. I, I mean, it just kind of echoes what I mentioned earlier that this judge is focused on the statement and the consequences of it. And he's going to deny the motion because he keeps talking about it. And he referenced, hey, the attorney made a statement and Johnny Depp was found liable for it. So listen up. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, this statement is going to be the crux of this case. Yes, and look what just happened on a trial we all watched. Uh, Dr. John, you watched that one closely with us. And uh, here with this one, obviously, you know, we're talking about very different sets of circumstances here and so much sadness with the deaths of these two young people, you know, presumably, you know, uh, the presumption being made by the Petito family is that it was Brian Laundrie who killed her. We know she died, you know, at the hands of someone else. We know it was a homicide because of what the coroner told us, you know, we know he died by suicide, according to, you know, the autopsy. So sad. And now these parents are, are battling it out. Um, and at the heart of this, you know, we know there was a, a domestic violence dynamic going on that went undetected. The, the world watched that video. Um, you know, here we are now, you know, almost, a, you know, a year out from when that was previously playing out and the nation was captivated. What are some of the things you think are important to think about, about relationships and when there is toxicity or something unhealthy or violent going on? Um, what are things that parents need to be kind of mindful of with their own children and sort of detecting those kinds of things? It's going to be important that parents teach their children and model healthy relationships, healthy communication styles. You know, not not every relationship is perfect. Not every not every relationship was without problems, right? But how do you both, right, as, as the the two partners, how do you both in a healthy way resolve all of those issues? And also that you, it's hard to get yourself out of an abusive relationship. It's not necessarily just as easy as just leaving the person. Sometimes there are a lot of issues that are at stake, right? A lot of vulnerabilities from the person being abused and it's so important to reach out and make sure that you have contact with uh, with others and uh, professionals who can help you make the the informed decision that you need to make in order to either leave a relationship or remain in one exactly well said dr john judge kimberly thank you both kindly we're going to squeeze in a break when we come back we'll hear uh, the last of the arguments by the lawyer for the laundry parents who are not there in court today, but the Petito parents are. Uh, you can see a lot of pain on their faces as they're listening to this, and we're going to hear from their attorney. Stay with us. This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. At joincalibrate.com. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. So we've got our cameras in Venice, Florida this afternoon for a hearing to dismiss a lawsuit filed by the parents of Gabby Petito. She was that Van Life YouTube star uh, and her name was circulated all across the country as there was a search for her. She went missing. Her fiance uh, was the one under a cloud of suspicion. Uh, her remains were found. We know she was killed by someone else. His remains were found sometime later. Uh, he is said to have died by suicide. And the parents uh, now are embattled in the, in the civil lawsuit where the Petito parents are saying that the laundry parents caused them extra mental anguish and emotional distress by not helping them and giving them information when their daughter was missing. And the laundries are saying, look, we had no obligation to say anything to you and you can't prove we knew anything. So those are the legal positions and his honor is hearing arguments from both sides here. So the laundry parents are defending this suit for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And right now their attorney is arguing before the judge to dismiss it. Let's go back in now where we left off. Uh, the criminal investigation earlier, so I won't go through that again. Um, Your Honor, with regard to the four corners of the complaint argument, um, like I said before, the laundries are residents of Florida. It's alleged in the complaint. As such, the Constitution fully applies to them, and the court can consider those rights. Um, you know, the plaintiffs are essentially asking the court to force the defendants to go through discovery, pretrial proceedings, summary judgment, just to get to the point where the court finds that the defendants have constitutional rights. 
Uh, that's just a waste of judicial resources and the resources of the parties. Um, Your Honor, with regard to the affirmative defense, um, there are nobody cited any cases where the legally permissible element is labeled an, an affirmative defense. Uh, I certainly haven't seen anything where, where it's the, the defendant's burden to prove that uh, if there were to be a trial such that it would be an affirmative defense. Um, you know, rather, the, the legally permissible element is really intertwined with the outrageous element. Um, in, the, you know, in the seminal case of Metropolitan Life versus McCarson, which is the Florida Supreme Court case that established uh, the cause of action, um, the court explained how it applied in that case. And it said, the facts as a matter of law are not so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency. Rather, the insurance company, according to the terms of the policy, had the right to demand proof of ineligibility for Medicaid, or from, sorry, for Medicare. And then it, it goes on and it says, Metropolitan did m no more than assert legal rights in a legally permissible way. As such, Metropolitan's actions are privileged under the circumstances. So, Your Honor, it's not really a defense. It's really part of the outrageous calculus, the outrageousness calculus that the conduct isn't legally outrageous if there is a privilege or a legal right that, that's being asserted. Uh, and, Your Honor, we cite some additional cases in our, in our reply that I'll rely upon in that regard. Um, and Your Honor also, also said that even if this is an affirmative defense, uh, which I don't think it is, the court can consider an affirmative defense if it is apparent from the face of the complaint. Uh, Your Honor, we would, we would argue that uh, constitutional rights are apparent from the face of the complaint. They allege a crime was committed. They allege an attorney was hired. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not a situation where um, the court can't consider the defendant's constitutional rights. And in fact, in the case Huzar versus Gross, which we cited in our papers, it's a first DCA case from 1985. It's a defamation case. Um, and in that case, the court was considering a First Amendment privilege on a motion to dismiss and held that trial courts, upon motions to dismiss, Routine, routinely make decisions as to whether a privilege applies to protect an, alleged, an allegedly defamatory statement. So again, in that, con in that context, the court held that on a motion to dismiss, the, the court can consider a constitutional right of a defendant if that constitutional right is their defense. Okay, well, well let, let's just ask. I, I know you have identified what you contend is one crime, which is to actively assist Brian uh, evade capture, essentially. Assuming, of course, that and, and not there's this is not within the four corners. I mean, we know outside of the four corners, but not in the four corners. Is there an uh, allegation that there was an arrest warrant out for him? But assume, for the sake of argument, that 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 is sufficient for purposes of us to find that there was um, some sort of active crime, if you will. Is there any other crime that the Laundries have been accused of or could potentially be accused of? Because before you can invoke a constitutional right to remain south, there's got to be a crime, right? Well, Your Honor, there doesn't necessarily have to be a crime. You just have to believe that you may be in jeopardy of a potential investigation. Well, doesn't um, the case law talk about it has to be a chain in the causation towards a crime? It, your Honor, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you on that point. What I'm saying, though, is there doesn't have to be a formal investigation. If I left this courtroom and committed a crime and nobody knew about it, I'm not obligated to, to go confess that crime. Like, I, I, can, I can assert my silence for as long as I feel like I need to to protect myself. Um, well, let me ask you this, because, you know, the case law I'm familiar with is in a deposition the Fifth Amendment would have to be invoked as to each specific question. So, for instance, if the question is, what is your name, you might not have a Fifth Amendment right to not answer that, depending on the context of the alleged crime. So I get back to what is the crime here? And isn't that really something that we need more pleadings to be able to accurately identify so that I have a, a better standard as to whether or not your Fifth Amendment argument actually is applicable? I, I don't think so, Your Honor. Um, I mean, certainly the, the plaintiffs have alleged criminal conduct, most of which by Brian Laundrie. I'll, I'll agree with that. 
Um, but they do allege that the Laundries, you know, potentially were trying to assist Brian Laundry um, in leaving the country, which could be an obstruction, uh, could be something else. Um, there could be, it could, you know, again, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not leaving the complaint when we talk about that. And so in that, in that regard, um, you know, the defendants still wouldn't have an obligation to speak about other things that may be sort of tangentially related to the whole situation um, if, there was, if there is potentially a crime involved. I mean, Your Honor, in Miranda versus Arizona, um, the, you know, the, the, court, the Supreme Court held the privilege is fulfilled only when the person is guaranteed the right to remain silent unless he chooses to speak in unfettered exercise of his own free will. So it's, it's the defendant's exercise. It's not something where, um, you know, the defendant can maintain his silence only with regard to certain things. If, he, if he's not being compelled to answer questions, he doesn't have to speak, period, at all. Um, again, from Miranda versus Arizona, the privilege has come rightfully to be recognized in part as an individual's substantive right, a right to a private enclave where he may lead a private life. That right is the hallmark of our democracy. So again, Your Honor, it's, it's not, in Miranda versus Arizona, the court wasn't parsing what questions a defendant can or cannot answer. They said the right is a private enclave where a person can lead a private life. They can maintain that privacy for as long as they're able. Now, of, co now, of course, like there are certain situations if defendant is subpoenaed to testify, perhaps like, you know, certain questions could be parsed, like what the person's name is or something, as long as that's not incriminating, which in some contexts it is. Um, th this is, th th you know, again, going to the plaintiff's argument, they haven't alleged that anybody was compelling anybody to do something and they refused or something like that. In, in that context, the... Everybody has the right to their private enclave. They don't have to come and affirmatively state everything they know about everything. Um, that's just not the way our society works. It's not the way, you know, it's not how the Constitution works. People are protected until they're not. Um, and so that, in my opinion, Your Honor, um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that the laundries would have an obligation to provide certain information and not provide other information that they're able, they can, they can withhold all information until it's compelled of them. That that's, you know, or they're provided immunity by the government or whatever the circumstance might be. Um, well, let, let, let's, let's put a, a pin in that right now so I can hear from your opponent. Yes, your honor. And your honor, uh, for our remaining arguments, uh, we'll just rely upon our papers unless the court has some specific questions uh, that you'd like to address. Thank you, sir.